So the spanning tree protocol exists to have bridges dynamically discover that subset of the topology, which is loop-free, or it's a tree, and yet it has just enough connectivity so that where physically possible, there is a path between every switch. If, of course, the wiring breaks, then that switch is no longer connected, so it's no longer part of the topology. So when you look at a spanning tree protocol, there are several standard flavors. There is traditional spanning tree, which is standardized in 802.1D. There is rapid spanning tree, or RSTP, which is standardized in 802.1W. And there is multiple spanning tree, or MSTP, in 802.1S. These are all IEEE standards. There are also proprietary flavors of spanning tree, mostly done by Cisco. So there is the old pavilion spanning tree, or PVST, and Cisco also decided to come up with Rapid Pavilion Spanning Tree, or RPVST+. We are now going to look at traditional spanning tree because all other spanning trees are based on this traditional spanning tree. And understanding how it works will tell us how spanning tree in general works. So switches will exchange messages that will allow them to compute the spanning tree. These messages are called bridge protocol data units or BPDUs. And there are two types. There's configuration, usually when it's starting, and there's a TCN, topology change notification, when there's a change in topology, either link has gone down or a switch is off or something. So the first step, and this actually goes into four steps um, in total. So the first step is you need to decide on a point of reference, which we'll call the root bridge. And this is done through an election process. The process is based on the bridge ID. The bridge ID is composed of the bridge priority, which is a two byte value that is configurable and the MAC address, which comes set by the manufacturer of the switch. So every switch starts by sending BPDUs with a root bridge ID equal to its own bridge ID. So all the switches are saying, I am the root. And then every BPDU that is received is analyzed to see if there is a lower root bridge ID being announced by somebody else. If so, every switch will replace the value of the advertised root bridge in the PBT, BPDUs it's sending with this lower one that it has received. So eventually, all the switches will agree on who the root bridge is. So let us look at this in action. We have three switches, switch A, switch B, and switch C interconnected as shown. All switches have the same priority, which we've shown as a number 32768. Then the other part is the MAC address. So switch A has the MAC address that ends in AA in hexadecimal, switch B ends in BB in hexadecimal, and switch C in CC. So looking at this, and they all have the same priority, which one will be elected as a root bridge? The answer is switch A because it has the smallest MAC address. In hexadecimal, AA is smaller than B and C. Now that you have elected the bridge, step two is you now need to determine the root port on each switch. This is done by finding the port which has the lowest root path cost, which is the cumulative cost of all the links leading to the root bridge if you try to reach the root going out through that port. Now, every link on a switch has a path cost. The path cost is defined by the spanning tree protocol and it's inversely proportional to the link speed. So the faster the link, the lower the cost. So at 10 Mbps, if you see the spanning tree cost will be 100, the rapid spanning tree cost is a lot higher. And this is because if you look down at the table, for 100 gig or one terabyte uh, links, there is no defined spanning tree cost, and most vendors will just set it to one or zero. 
so you cannot tell the difference between a one terabyte link or a 100 gig link but for rapid spanning tree you have 200 for 100 gig and 224 uh, one terabit the important ones the ones which are most common on networks as of today will be either 100 meg a gig or 10 gig um, mostly within there so 100 will be 19 4 and 2 for sp traditional spanning tree so the root path cost is an accumulation of all of these link costs and the cost that it has learned from neighboring switches so the question that your switch is trying to answer is if i send packets through this link how much will it cost total to read the root bridge So to find a root port, the root bridge sends out BPDUs with a root path cost of zero because it is the root bridge. So it costs zero to reach it. The neighbor receives this BPDU and then adds the path cost of that port it received it on to the root path cost. And then it sends these BPDUs out through other ports with that new cumulative value as the root path cost. Every time you receive a BPDU with the root path cost as a switch, you add the, the cost of the port that you've received it on and send it out to the other ports. So on each switch, the port which has the lowest root path cost becomes the root port. This is the port with the best path to the root bridge. So if you look at our three switches again, we've now added some details. Port 1 of switch A is connected to port 1 of switch B. Port 2 of switch A is connected to port 1 of switch C. And ports 2 of switches B and C are connected to each other. These are all fast Ethernet or 100 Mbps links, which is why the cost is 19. So the question is, what is a path cost on each port? And the switches have to uh, decide which is the root port on each switch. So, from switch A to switch B, the path cost on port 1 will become 19, that link. And then from switch A to switch C, the path cost will also be 19. Then between switch B and switch C, if switch B is to use port 2, it will need to go uh, 19, which is a cost to C, plus 19, which is a cost to A, so that is 38. And that is the same thing with switch C. If it uses port 2, that is 19 to switch B plus another 19 to switch A. So based on that, the root port on both switch B and switch C will be port 1. Okay, so now we have root ports. Step 3, we haven't solved the loop problem yet because we still have all the links are still active. So each network segment needs to have only one switch forwarding traffic to and from that segment. And the way it's done is you identify a designated port per network segment. And that is the one with the lowest cumulative root path cost to the root bridge. We shall see how this happens later. Now, it's possible for two or more ports in a single segment to have identical root path costs. This is a tie condition. Now, all spanning tree decisions are based on the following sequence of conditions to break ties. Number one, you choose the lowest root bridge ID. Number two, the lowest root path cost to the root bridge. Number three, the lowest sender bridge ID. And number four, the lowest sender port ID. So if we look at our same network again, we have switch A, switch B, switch C. We already know which one the root ports are, but now the question is which port should be the designated port on each segment. For the segment between A and B, it's going to be, so for any segment that includes the root port, so A and B or A and C, um, of course the designated port is going to be the port on the root bridge because switch A is a root bridge. So any segment that includes a root bridge, the designated ports will always be on switch A. 
Now between switch B and switch C, you had two ports which had the same cost of 38. But if you look at the hierarchy of tie breakers, switch B has a lowest bri uh, bridge ID because the MAC address is smaller. So port two of switch B will be the designated port for that B to C link. The fourth and final step is any port that is not elected as either a root port or nor a designated port is put inside the blocking state. So this breaks the loop and completes spanning tree. So if we go back to our diagram, all the ports of switch A will be um, designated ports, obviously. Port 1 of switch B is a root port. Port 1 of switch C is also a root port. Port 2 of switch C is not a designated and it's not a root port, so it is put inside blocking state. So it's neither a root port nor a designated port.